Well, would you stand with me as I'm reading from the 16th chapter of Luke? If you've been with us, you know that Jesus is teaching from this parable beginning in verse 19. A rich man and a man named Lazarus. The rich man had plenty, Lazarus had nothing. And yet when they die, their roles are completely reversed. One lifts up his eyes in hell and torment, the other in heaven. And then we have this conversation when the rich man finds out that there's no escape from this eternal lot that he has come to. Beginning in verse 26 of Luke 16, it says, and besides this, uh, Abraham is telling him, between us and you a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. And he said that I beg you, Father, to send him, Lazarus, to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Our Father, as we come to your word this morning. We recognize it, we acknowledge it as the special revelation of an infinitely loving God to a creation that has fallen and is in need, desperate need of saving. And so you have given us this word to explain how that can be accomplished, how you have accomplished that actually, and how we can be part of that we will give our heart and life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And so we pray that you will teach us this morning from your word. We pray for um, all of those in our congregation who are hurting in one way or another. Whatever the need may be, we pray for it. We rejoice with those who rejoice. We pray for our missionaries and we pray for those that you have sent to far places that we have the privilege to participate with. We pray for... Uh, Teresa this morning as she's been with us a couple weeks ago and we ask that you'll help her to continue to get the support she needs to arrive in the place where you've sent her to Bangladesh. Lord, would you bless her life richly. We pray for the low season. We thank you for the continued good reports on Daniel now over the last three or four weeks. Thank you for the ones who have faithfully prayed for him from our congregation and other places and we ask that you will give them true guidance and direction as he's Certainly not out of the woods yet, but we thank you for this progress that's been made. Give them help to know how they can best accomplish the mission you've given them to translate your word for those in far places. Bless our time this morning, Lord. Use it for your glory. Help the distractions that would come so easily to us now to be dismissed. Help us to concentrate for these moments on what you've said to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Let me just acknowledge early on that I'm probably going to step on a few toes this morning. Uh, please bear with me and listen to me all the way through. Uh, I know some of you are saying you step on my toes every week, and uh, I tell you I do not do that. I'm, I see a hand in the back. Um, this is uh, the Word of God, and, and believe me, He steps on my toes before I come here and do that to you. So um, I trust that it's the Spirit of God who speaks to us. Paul told his young protege, Timothy, in 2 Timothy 3, 16, all scripture, all scripture, all scripture is breathed out by God. All of it. It's breathed out by God. And it's profitable. It's profitable for teaching it's profitable for reproof. That's the toes getting stepped on part. It's profitable for correction. It's, pro pro it's profitable for training in righteousness that the man or woman of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So what does it take to equip us for every good work? To be Christ-like in our life. The Word, right? What else? Nothing else. That's the message. The Word of God is sufficient. Beloved, how, 
How bad do we misunderstand that and how often we go astray when it comes to that? Sarah Young has written a book, bestseller, Jesus Calling. Some of you probably read it and thought you got a lot of good stuff out of it, and I trust that you did, and I hope you did, but there's a problem with that book. She claims that the things that she put in that book came to her directly from Jesus. She says this, I know God communicated with me through the Bible, but I yearn for more. Increasingly, I wanted to hear what God had to say to me personally on a given day. Sounds good, doesn't it? But it's in violation of 2 Timothy 3. It's a statement that makes an idol out of me, that puts my experience above God's revelation and opens the door to chaos. <clears throat> Be alert, beloved, to things like that. It's the kind of thing that leads to statements like this from Rob Bell in his book, Velvet Elvis. Don't ask me about the title and don't read the book to find out. But here's what he says. He says, when people say that, we need, that all we need is the Bible, it is simply not true. Seriously. Really. You can call yourself a pastor and make that kind of statement. It's incredible. Paul says that the word equips us for every good work. So who are you going to believe? Rob Bell or the Apostle Paul? Jesus, in the passage before us, comes down heavily on the side of Paul. Actually, Paul comes down heavily on the side of Christ. Because I think there's no passage in Scripture that is more clear on the sufficiency of Scripture than the one that we have in front of us this morning. This parable is about hell, yes, but as we've seen, it's more about identity and the fact that the identity that we choose now is what defines us in eternity, either an eternity separated from God in hell or an eternity in heaven with God forever. So important to understand that. And so the outline we've used here is the eternal me is determined in this life. It's me unformed while I still have the opportunity to change my identity under the direction of, of God. Secondly, that death reveals but does not change me. In other words, when I die, that's it. I am now unveiled. Who I chose in this life is who I'll be forever. And now thirdly, we come today to verses 27 through 31. The true me is found in God's word. This is how the new me will be unveiled or, the, or unearthed through the word of God. A lot of people don't believe that. They insist that it's the Bible plus something, plus ritual, plus feelings. As important as all of those can be and are, they are not part of the sufficiency of scripture. Something else is needed as well. Jesus is gonna deny that emphatically. He hammers home in this passage the sufficiency of Scripture to meet our every need. So let's look at it. Four points in this passage. First of all, the fault finding, verses 27 and 28. The fault finding. The rich man says, I beg you, Father Abraham, to send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers so that he may warn them lest they come into this place of torment. Now that sounds like a reasonable request on the surface, but behind that is a benign, but behind that benign request is, a, is an accusation against God. The great Lutheran commentary, R.C.H. Lenski, comments this way. He says, the rich man's plea for his brothers is a covert accusation of God who could have prevented his arriving in hell by a simple means, but failed to use that means. If the rich man had only been warned, as he now proposed to have his brothers warned, he would not be in this place of torment. Yes, he is more concerned about his brothers than God is. Think about that. He knows better than God how to save them and blames God for this terrible fate. I think he's right. What he's saying is this plea is simply a subtle means of blaming God, of saying I wouldn't be here if you'd done your job right. It's a 
form of self-justification that's coming straight from hell. Does it sound familiar? It should, because we all do it all the time. This is the same kind of thing we're doing when we ask the question, where was God when my daughter got cancer? Where was God when my boy got on drugs? Where was God when we lost our house or when I lost my job? Where was God? Why doesn't God answer my prayer? Why doesn't God answer my prayer for money? Why doesn't God answer my prayer for a new job? Why doesn't God answer my prayer for a good husband? Why did God fail me? We treat God like a glorified delivery boy when we need him. We accuse him when he doesn't deliver on demand. And we ignore him most of the time. And we certainly, we certainly take the leeway of disobeying any command that we don't particularly like. We rationalize it. We come to the conclusion that it's because God is out of touch in some way. That was only good for those people in the first century and doesn't apply to me. But we fail when we take God's commands not seriously. And beloved, what Jesus is teaching us is that these attitudes toward a sovereign God come straight from hell and they lead straight to hell. We cannot, why, why does the Lord say the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom? Because it's true. We should experience the love of God in our life and we need to, but you can't experience the true love of God in your life until you've experienced who God really is and have come to fear him as the consuming fire that Hebrews 12 tells us that he is. However it appears, God is never unloving, he's never indifferent, he's never negligent, and he is never ever at fault, not ever. If you are here this morning as an unbeliever, God is not at fault, the fault is yours. If you are here as a believer but you're not growing, your life is a mess, you don't know what to do with it, the fault is not God's, the fault is yours. God is never at fault. God never does anything wrong, God never fails. Finding fault with God is a denial of reality. It's one step away from reality. And the further, of course, you step away from the reality, the easier it gets to live there. In Disneyland, I like to call it, fantasy land, right? By asking for a special messenger, the rich man is saying, you didn't get it right the first time, God, but here's an opportunity to make it up, right? That's what he's saying. That's the attitude that got him where he is in the first place. He thought he knew better than God. In truth, God always gets it right. It's only we who get it wrong, and we have to come to that point. Fault finding with God. Now, I understand we all, when we hit hard times and we face loss and difficult things happen in our life. We go through times when we ask questions. It's all right to do that, but you can't do that for long. Finding fault with God is a no-win game. We must look elsewhere. It's so easy to decide the ancient rules don't apply anymore. You know, God's defined roles for marriage and family and church, ah, they're passe. We know better now. Warnings against covetousness. You know, the, uh, the movie Wall Street. Remember Gordon Gecko, played by, was it Michael Douglas, I think? Greed is good. What was he doing? All he was doing was defining, some, or stating outright what our society has already decided. Greed is good. God is out of touch. God's definition of sexual mores is absurd in our 21st century world to think that you should live according to those. Loving others above self, giving your rights up for the sake of unity. Come on, if you don't look out for number one, who's going to? We put God's commands out of sight so easily, feeling that God is out of touch. And he's never more out of touch, of course, than when he doesn't answer our prayers the way we want them answered and in the timing that we want them answered. Or like, or like the little boy, you know, his parents were trying to teach him about God. 
So they taught him, who made, the, who made the sun? And he responded, well, God did. Who made the rain? God did. So they come into his room one day and they ask him, who made that mess? And he said, God did. I mean, you know, what, what else would he say, right? God gets the blame. God, says, God gets the blame for all the things that we do. And just like the rich man in hell blamed God, so we blame God when he doesn't cater to our every whim and our every need. And beloved, we are just so wrong. Just as he was wrong, we are wrong. Whatever bitterness we, were li we are living with, whatever grudges we are holding, however we are thinking negatively about God this morning, we are wrong and he is right. We must have a big God. We must understand who he is. We must understand he does not do wrong things. And when that kind of thing is coming into our heart, what, what does it tell us? It tells us it's time for repentance, right? There needs to be a time of truly falling on our face before God and acknowledging the sinner here is me, not thee. The fault finding. Secondly, what's God's response to this fault finding? Verse 29. Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Now, Moses and the prophets, that's not a new rock group. I know some of you might get confused on that. I'm waiting for some Christian you know, group to come up with Moses and the prophets as their name. I'm sure it's going to happen eventually. That's not who this is. This is the Jewish way of saying the Bible, right? Moses is the first five books. That's how they commonly referred to it. The prophets is basically the rest of the Old Testament. So, so what Jesus is saying here through Abraham, listen, Mr. Rich Man, your brothers don't need another messenger. They need to listen to the messengers they've already had. They need to listen to Moses. They need to listen to the prophets. They need to go back and read what I've already written down in black and white to make clear to you what truth is. That's God's response. You need to be in Scripture. It's as strong a statement as you can get on the sufficiency of Scripture. They've got Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. Now this parable, of course, is aimed right at the Pharisees, right? But interestingly enough, who in the first century Palestine would have thought that they were more listening to the word of God and more cared about the word of God than the Pharisees. Nobody. They thought they were there. They, they were all about the Bible in their own minds, but what they were really about was their own modernized, updated version of the Bible. Their lives were all about their own traditions that had built up around the Bible. And what Jesus is saying is you're you need to get back to basics here, folks. You got to get back to what the Bible actually says. You need to get back to what Moses and the prophets actually say. You don't need another messenger. You need to listen to the ones I've already sent. But they would not. The straight truth of the Bible was too much for them. That's why they had built up all these traditions. They understood that that Old Testament Bible, that Ten Commandments, you didn't even have to go any further than the 20th chapter of Exodus, let alone all the rest of the stuff that was out there. That condemned them right off the bat. They knew they didn't obey all Ten Commandments consistently, constantly. That's why they built up these. But what they weren't realizing is God had always said, I know you can't do that. That's why I want you to be circumcised in the heart as well as in your body. That's why I want you to understand it's about faith. That's why I said about Abraham, Abraham believed God and, 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 and it was counted to him for righteousness. That's what God says you need to get back to. But they were not listening. They were turning down the Bible in favor of their own interpretations. How much, again, do we do this, right? That God of the Old Testament can't stand him. Love the loving God of the New Testament. If, is that where you land? I hope not. Read Revelation sometime if you think that. The God is the same in the Old Testament as he is in the New Testament. We have so many people. You know what? My experience is most people who reject the Bible haven't even read it. Most of them haven't even read it. Because what I've found is if people really get in and begin to read the Bible, the Bible is, the 
Bible is such a thing of beauty. The, you begin to find out this part corresponds to this part, this part explains that part, and you begin to realize, wow, this was written by over 1,500 years by 40 plus authors coming from all kinds of different backgrounds and walks of life, and it, ha and it maintains this absolutely incredible consistency pointing as you look at it at the Savior, at Jesus Christ. It's an incredible book. And an honest seeker will come to it and begin to realize that. You know, they, they tell us, well, the Bible is just historically, you know, it's, it's not historically accurate and it is, and it is, it is scientifically, scientific nonsense. The Bible clearly isn't truly the word of God. And I say again, have you studied that out? I refer you as I had before to Sir William Ramsey, the, the great British archaeologist who went to Palestine in the late 1800s in order to disprove the Bible, specifically. He was going to show through archaeology, which was the developing science in those days, that the Bible was not true. And he decided, I'll start with Luke. And he took the book of Luke and he took the book of Acts that Luke had written. And by the time he was 40 years over there digging around in the dirt, he figured out that, you know what, I can't find a single thing that Luke said that wasn't true. He became a believer. And he got knighted on the side. But the big thing that happened is he became a believer in Jesus Christ. Don't tell me the Bible isn't true. Do you know the Bible is scientifically? I, I love the people who say the Bible is scientifically nonsense. The Bible, listen, the Bible is miles ahead of, human, of the human race. Did you know that? The human race, Hi, Hipparticus was a, he was a Greek philosopher. He counted the stars two centuries before Christ. 1,022 of them. 1,022 stars. 400 years later, we had advanced. And Ptolemy counted the stars and he came up with 1,056 of them, more than in Hollywood. We lived there, I can tell you. 1,056 stars were in the sky. 1,400 years later, we actually went backwards one and Kepler counted 1,055 stars. And then in 1610, Galileo invented the telescope. When he got it all built, he stuck his eyeball up to the eyepiece and he fell to his knees because what he saw in the sky were countless millions of stars. <laughs> he couldn't begin to count them, right? Scientists now tell us that in the observable universe, there are 10 to the 26th stars. That's 10 with 26 zeros behind it. That's a big number. I promise you nobody actually stood there and counted those. It's a guess. And that's just in the observable universe because we don't know how far beyond what we can see it goes on. We don't know. So there are countless stars. Amazing. 2,700 years before, 2,300 years before Galileo, Jeremiah said this, Jeremiah 33, 22, as the host of the heaven cannot be numbered. God knew. The Bible knew. It just took a while for us to catch up. The Bible knew all along. Men believed that the earth was flat right up to the time of Columbus. At 2,700 years before Columbus, Isaiah said in God-breathed words, talked about the circle of the earth. God knew. Job described the earth hanging in space in Job 36. When the rest of the world was saying, well, I think the earth resides on the on the, on the back of an elephant or maybe an atlas's hands or something. We, we don't know for sure. God said, no, it's hanging in space, which is exactly where we finally found out it is. Job described the evaporation cycle hundreds of years before science caught up. Job described the rotation of the earth on its axis in Job 38, hundreds of years before mankind ever figured that out. No wonder God says, when you want to look for salvation, you just need to look in the book. His point is, 
If you can depend on the book for the little things, can't you depend on it for the big things? 1929, Mount Wilson in California, Edwin Hubble looked through the eyepiece of a new 100-inch telescope up there on Palomar, discovered the ever, an ever-expanding universe because what he saw was the red phase of some of the stars and he realized, whoa, those things are moving away. Nobody knew that before 1929. And he said, I think we have an expanding universe. One of the first guys to check that out was Einstein. And Einstein looked at it and he said, yeah, I don't know any other way to explain it except there can't be an expanding universe. The universe has to be eternal. And most of the scientists in the world followed him. Why? Because they didn't want a beginning. That implies a beginner, right? The universe must be eternal. And so for the next 60 years, when I was in college, this battle was still raging. Is it a Big Bang or is it an eternal universe? With by far the majority of scientists lining up on the side of the eternal universe. And then we put up the Hubble telescope in the early 1990s and they got a really good look at things. And guess what? The universe is expanding. There's any question about it. The implication is there's a beginning and so science now has a problem. They have a Big Bang theory of the beginning but they don't, know how, they don't have one clue how to explain that. They speculate. You can read Stephen Hawking and you, <laughs> if you want to see a guy trying to walk around circles trying to, on eggshells trying to explain something that he can't explain by any observable law of science, read him. Brilliant man. But he can't explain the beginning. God can. In the beginning, what? God created the heavens and the earth. The Bible knew it thousands of years before mankind caught on. Nobel laureate physicist Arno Penzias says this, he says, the best data we have concerning the Big Bang are exactly what I would have predicted had I nothing to go on but the five books of Moses, the Psalms, and the Bible as a whole. He's not a believer. He's just an honest critic, acknowledging what the Bible has known all along. So, beloved, the point is that the Bible speaks with authority even on peripheral subjects. Is it not the place we would want to go to seek salvation, which is what it's really all about? So God's response to any seeker, his first response is always the same. They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Scripture is sufficient. You don't need anything else. Go there. So did that convince the man in hell didn't convince him, did it? So we have another point here, the flawed logic in verse 30, the flawed logic. He said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, then they will repent. I think that's a really interesting verse because it's the first place where he gives any kind of acknowledgement about the possibility of a need for repentance. I don't know whether he's just playing along with what... Father Abraham is saying, because he doesn't have any hope to go anywhere else anyway, right? But whatever it is, he's kind of acknowledging, yeah, maybe we need repentance, but he's saying he's going to insist it takes more than Scripture to get there. Scripture won't get him there. A really, a really impressive miracle, that's the ticket. In fact, I got an idea. That, that, that guy, Lazarus, just send him back. Send him back from the dead. And I know when my brothers see that, boy, they will repent, like right now. Don't give me that Moses and the prophet stuff, Scripture. I mean, Scripture is boring. Come on. Let's razzle-dazzle them a little bit. Give them a miracle. Then they'll believe. Sounds like good logic from a human perspective, doesn't it? From a natural standpoint, I would accept that. I would think that sounds really impressive. But beloved, once again, we... We follow this logic. And when we do, we buy right into hell's philosophy. Remember where this philosophy came from. It came from hell. Miracles are the way to produce faith. But today we have a, we have a whole world full of, even in many cases, professing evangelical ministers suggesting we need something more. Scripture is nice. Let's have a verse or two. But what we need is more. We need some miracles. We need further proof. 
And we, and, and, and we, have, we have just fallen into the exact trap the Pharisees did. Remember how they, they, every time they're coming to Jesus and saying what? Give us a sign. I, I always wonder how Jesus stayed so patient. Why didn't he just march up? You know, the 50 people that he healed yesterday, right? You want a sign? You're still looking for a sign? And here we are, still looking for signs. We're just following in the path that these people went. We write bestsellers now about going to heaven and back. One, at least, that I know of going to hell and back. And we flock to them, you know, let's, hey, let, read this. And God is saying, no, read this. Here is truth. It's not about some exotic sign. We put our experience above the revelation of God. Beloved, that's a terrible place to land. Experience is flawed. Experience will take you anywhere you want to go. The Word of God will always lead you to truth. What's interesting to me about those books, by the way, one of them, one of the ones about heaven is just they recently recanted and admitted it was all a lie, one of them. Another thing, if you read them, what you'll find is they, they disagree with each other at points, let alone disagreeing with the Bible at certain points. You don't need something more. You need the Word. If you're looking for something more to bring into faith, you're looking in the wrong place. What a, the interesting thing about the guys that go to heaven, one guy that really went to heaven, which was Paul, right, came back and he said, I'm not allowed to tell you what I saw there. He always gives the lie to the rest of it to me. 2 Corinthians 12, he said that. And then we have modern prophets. Prophecy has become a big day in our deal. We got prophets everywhere, people with the word of truth everywhere. Prophets, people that are speaking supposedly a word from God, direct from God. Prophets on every street corner. But it's interesting to me, because I've read a lot of these guys, and this is, this is a typical, I've never run across one yet that claims 100% accuracy, never. Let me read a couple of them. This guy says, I figure if I hit two-thirds, I'm doing pretty good. This is one of the most revered, I'm not going to name him, but he's one of the most revered guys on the prophet scene today, one of the Kansas City prophets. Here's another one. He says, prophets are really messy. Prophets make mistakes. And he follows that up with telling how people have lost millions of dollars based on bad prophecies. And yet he insists on the validity of his prophecy ministry. We're easily led astray. God long ago, listen, you want God's opinion about prophets? Here it is. It's in Deuteronomy 18, verse 22. Listen to this. God said, when a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word that the Lord has not spoken. And then he tells you what to do about it. In Deuteronomy 18, verse 20, he says, But the prophet who presume, presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak, that same prophet shall die. God doesn't mess around about people claiming to represent him when they don't. God, are, were there prophets? Are there prophets? Absolutely. But, but God tells us in Ephesians 2, 22, that our faith now is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. B beloved, we're at the building stage. We're at the roof stage these days. As soon as a prophet comes along that's 100%, I'm on board. I haven't seen one. I haven't even seen one claim to be one. The, the, the standard isn't 50%, and it's not two-thirds, and it's not three-quarters, and it's not 90%. It's 100%. Current fascination with prophecy is just the old Pharisaic insistence on another sign in modern clothing. Listen, look at this in Revelation 22. Go there with me. It's the last chapter in the Bible and virtually the last verse. Revelation 22, verse 18. God speaking through John says this. Revelation 22, verse 18. I warn everyone 
who hears the words of prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. It's a pretty strong statement on the sufficiency of Scripture, wouldn't you say? And coming from a pretty viable source. And by the way, this is just a side note, but all those prophets that I quoted earlier, every one of them has been discredited on moral grounds, and every one of them has kept right on ministering as though nothing happened. Beware of placing experience above Scripture. It sounds good, <coughs> but according to God, it is flawed logic. Henry Frost, in his book, Miraculous Healing, says this, it may confidently be, be anticipated as the present apostasy increases, the Christ will manifest his deity and lordship in increasing measure through mir miracle signs, including healings. I don't know where he got that. It's not mentioned in the Bible anywhere. So I can only assume he made it up. He's not done. He says, he says well, the, the, the Christ will manifest his deity and lordship in increasing measure through miracle signs, including healings. We are not to say, therefore, that the word is sufficient. Listen, I have no boxes around God. God can heal anytime God wants to. God can do a miracle anytime God wants to. I think that they are limited in this day and time. But God can do anything he wants to anytime he wants to. But beloved, to say that we don't, that, that, that we need that in addition to the word is rubbish. It's the word that matters. It's the word that counts. It's the same flawed logic. Say, I'm going to believe because something like that happens. I need my miracle. Get your miracle today. Plant your seed for the miracle. Listen, run from that kind of stuff. It's not biblical. Same flaw of logic that the guy in hell used that God countered. Experience must be judged in the light of revealed truth and not the other way around. <clears throat> to claim that the word is not sufficient is to make a liar of God when he said in, in 2 Timothy 3, all scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for, for, te for teaching, for reproof, for correction and for training in righteousness, that the man or woman of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Scripture is sufficient. Here's the problem. It won't do you any good while it's sitting on your coffee table. Right? The problem is, in order for Scripture to be sufficient in your life, you have to study it. You have to absorb it. You have to read it. You have to take it in. You have to spend time with it. You have to ask the Holy Spirit to be your teacher as you meditate on it. You have to want it and consume it. We're looking for shortcuts. We're all looking for shortcuts. There aren't any. Final answer, verse 31. God's final word on the subject. If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone shall rise from the dead. Boy, that is pretty strong language, is it not? The word takes precedent over the miracle, even if you had one. The rich man says, one more good miracle, and my brothers would repent. I just know it. I don't want them to come here. And God says, no. If they're not listening to Moses and the prophets, if they're not taking into account the word that I have spent so much time and effort to give them. They're not going to believe even if somebody comes back from the dead. Rejection of Christ is not an intellectual issue. It's a moral issue. People don't repent because they don't want to repent. People don't repent because they love their sin more than they love God. You remember what happened after the feeding of the 5,000? John chapter 6. The next day the people were back for more. They wanted more miracles. They wanted more food. Jesus called them on it. He says, I know why you're here. It's because you want another meal. He says, instead of that, you need to do the work of God. They said, what's the work of God? Jesus answers in John 6, 29. He says, this is, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, then what sign 
do you do that we may see and believe you? What sign? I just fed you 5,000 of you yesterday, five loaves and two fish, and you asked for another sign? See, God knows that faith produced in sign will always need another sign tomorrow and another one the next day and another one the next day and another one the day after that. It does not produce saving faith. It didn't in Jesus' day. It won't in our day. Miracles were to authenticate the messenger. In the days when the revelation was changing, the, the miracles were to authenticate the messenger. They were not to produce faith. Paul clarifies that completely for us. We didn't get it when he says in Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by what? Another miracle? Hearing by the word of God. That's where faith comes from. That's why if you're struggling to believe God, if you're struggling to understand, if you're struggling to believe that God is good because of all the bad things that are happening in your life, you need to be in the Word. The Word is the thing that will change your life, but nothing else. The Word is the thing that God says, I have given to you that will make you complete. The Word is the thing that will put your life back together. The Word is the thing. And you're not paying any attention. We needed further proof of this when God said, they're not gonna, if they reject the word, they're not going to believe even if somebody comes back from the dead. A couple of weeks after Jesus said this, somebody did come back from the dead, Lazarus. He resurrected Lazarus, didn't he? Came back from the dead. They pulled him out of the grave. It wasn't like he was just laying there and he came back from the dead. Maybe he was and maybe he wasn't. He was so dead they had buried him and he was dead and gone and in the grave. And he was resurrected. So the whole countryside believed, right? No. The Bible tells us that there were a few who were on the fence who believed because of that. But here's the general consensus. This is in John eleven fifty three. 53. At the end of that chapter, it says, so from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. That was the reaction. Can't have this kind of thing going on in our midst. And of course, a few weeks later, they did put him to death. Three days later, he rose again. And instead of accepting the fact of the resurrection and checking it out, the vast majority of the world turned against it. There was universal skepticism, not universal repentance. People who don't, don't not repent for lack of evidence. People don't repent because they don't want to repent. They prefer to run their own lives. We do that as believers too. It's true of unbelievers, but it's true of believers. As believers, we don't repent as sin comes into our life because we want to run our own life. We want to do it our own way. We want to have our own answer. And God is saying, here's the final answer. The final answer is my word. You need to hang on to that. When you hang on to that, you realize, number one, this life is not all there is. There's more to come. You realize that the only hope there is is in me. You realize that Jesus Christ has done all there is to do to save you and to bring you to saving faith and to assure not only your life now, but your eternal future. It's all in the word. God's final answer is you have the word, live by that. If you refuse that, I have nothing further to say. It's the word. Are you in the Word? Do you know the Word? Are you letting the Word infect you? Are you absorbing it? Is it becoming precious to you day by day? Somebody came up to the great evangelist, R.A. Torrey, a guy came up and he said, I, he said, uh, he said I'm, I'm not getting anything out of my Bible study. What can I do? How can I study it so that it will mean something to me? And Torty said, well, read it. He said, well, I do read it. Torty said, read it some more. He said, well, how? He said, just take a passage. Read it 12 times a day for 30 days. I mean, really read it. Really absorb it. Really let it become part of your being. The guy says, well, what passage? Tori told him, 2 Peter. It's not exactly the most edifying book in the Bible. Well, it's a good one. He told him, 2 Peter. 
I'm assuming it's the first thing that came to his mind. I don't know. And he knew it was short. If he's going to have him do it 12 times a day. But he said, read 2 Peter. He ran into them a little later. The man said this. He said, soon I was talking 2 Peter to everyone I met. I ruined my Bible, marking it up. His wife said, yes. And as the pages have been getting black, your life has been getting white. Let me tell you, when your wife can say that about you, that's a good thing. Don't ask my wife any questions today, okay? <laughs> Don't be going there. The Word is where you'll find your identity. It's where you'll find out who God is and you'll find out who you are. Learn it. Live it. It is sufficient. Martin Luther said this, I have covenanted with my Lord that he should not send me visions or dreams or even angels. I am content with this gift of the scriptures, which teaches and supplies all that is necessary, both for this life and for the life that is to come. That's true. But not if it's just sitting on the coffee table. You gotta use it. Let's pray. Father, it's convicting. We accuse you and we shortchange you and we blame you and we sometimes go so far as to pretty much kind of castigate you in the way that you're acting and yet we are giving you nothing in return by way of being in the word that you have given us is such a precious, precious thing. Help us not to miss it. Help us not to miss what you have for us. Help us to find our identity in that place where you will meet us. When we mean business with you, you will surely mean business with us. You will not fail. Help us as we sing in closing, Father, to make this the prayer of our heart, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Would you